Hello, everyone. My name is Becca Choate, and I serve as Associate for Global Advocacy and Education with Global Ministries of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and the United Church of Christ. Welcome to Wednesdays with the World, a United Church of Christ webinar series. This series highlights the ways in which the quest for justice is intersectional and global providing opportunities for increased awareness of global concerns and highlighting opportunities for advocacy and action. Today's webinar is called Together in Hope, a journey through Southern Asia and is part of Global Ministries Southern Asia Initiative, which began at General Synod in 2019 and will end at the end of June, 2021. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Brandy Midget Crosby, Communications Associate for Global Ministries, who's going to introduce the documentary she filmed while traveling through the region in 2019. Welcome, Brandy. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Um, it is honestly a pleasure to finally be here and introduce this film. Um, and before I introduce it, I want to say a special thank you to these specific people, um, Dina Bandu Manchala, Phyllis Richards, um, Tom Kidder, and of course, our partners, the Indian Samaritans, the American Siloan Mission, Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, and last but not least, the Evangelical Protestant Church of Timor. I was afforded the opportunity to take my camera on a 20, 26 day journey to the Southern Asia region um, to document our stories from our partners. Um, I hope you enjoy this film. It's about 34 minutes and it just gives you a glimpse into their lives and the stories they are um, so grateful to tell and share with our global partners in the, United, in the United States. So without further ado, here's the film. Hello, my name is Brandy. I work for Global Ministries. Recently, I had the opportunity to go on a pilgrimage to Southern Asia as part of the Global Ministries Southern Asia Initiative. And not everyone is offered this opportunity, so I decided to take my camera with me so you could experience this journey as I did. On this journey, you will meet our global partners and learn more about who they are and the work they do. Thank you for saying yes to God and joining in on this journey. So let's get started. Our first stop is India. The Republic of India is home to over 1.3 billion people. India is a very diverse country. It has different cultures and over 20 languages. Common religions practiced in India include Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Sikhism, and Buddhism. Some of the most common issues that plague India are unemployment, poverty, and pollution. Ministries has 17 partners in India who do a variety of social justice and faith work. Partners include the Center for Social Equity and Inclusion and the Indian Samaritans. One major issue India is facing is a lack of human dignity. This can impact one's educational opportunities, income, health, and so much more. Many dialect people are pushed beyond the margins and have to work some of the most demeaning and laborious jobs. Dialect people are members of the lowest caste system in India. Yeah. 
I met some of the most miraculous children who, despite their circumstances, find joy in their communities and everyday lives. These young ladies were so eager to have us meet their friends. Early child marriage in communities like this are heavily encouraged. It was wonderful to see these young girls' families be so invested in the Indian Samaritan program and what it could do for their children. While in New Delhi, we were able to visit with Santosh of the Indian Samaritan program and see how this program is dismantling caste-based discrimination and upholding human dignity through an after-school program that aims to change the minds of children beyond systematic oppression and break the cycle of poverty through education. We work with children who are in the first generation in education and our effort is to make sure that they do not leave the formal education for any reason. The parents are not in a position to support and guide them in education, so we have kept trained teachers who spend time with them every day and prepare them to go to school. And we do everything to make sure that they do not drop out. And many of these girl, uh, girl children get married when they are 14, 15 years. So we have managed to counsel and convince the parents so these girl children uh, continue their education so they are empowered and ultimately we want to make sure that the, the, the cycle of poverty is uh, broken with the empowerment of these children. Samaritans target the issues of child labor, malnutrition, school dropout rates, child marriage, and discrimination against disabled women and widows. As we journeyed through many slums in India, we were able to see the resiliency of the Dalit and tribal people. It was really hard to leave this place and not feel for the people you encountered. After leaving the Indian Samaritans program, I met up with some of our partners from the Center for Social Equity and Inclusion. The Center for Social Equity and Inclusion exists to deepen democracy and to develop a robust, inclusive society in India by enhancing the involvement of communities that are currently excluded. The core focus of their work is to promote equal rights and equitable opportunities for learning and leadership among children and young people from Dalit, tribal, and Muslim communities. The Center for Social Equity and Inclusion supports a group of women and young people who are working daily to make their lives better and the lives of those in their community. We visited a city called Kushampur Pahar and met with a group of women who meet regularly to work on issues like empowering one another, entrepreneurship, assisting women dealing with domestic violence and ending human trafficking, education reform, and much more. This community focuses on inclusion, human dignity, and freedom of religion. It was inspiring to see the work that these women are doing. It is also their hope that all children will be afforded with greater opportunities than the next generation. As a result of such action in the same slum, a group of young people get together to socialize, learn, do activities together, and learn job skills. The young people use their talents through storytelling to explain issues in their communities. Their performances highlight prominent issues within the dialect community.
Sri Lanka. Despite being a relatively small island, Sri Lanka is endowed with a diverse collection of landscapes, climates, and natural features. The island is home to many cultures, languages, and ethnicities. The majority of the population is from the Sinhalese ethnicity, while the Tamils make up the rest of the population. This large disparity in ethnicities did play a major role in the Sri Lankan Civil War from 1983 to 2009. Christians are a small minority of about 8% of the total population of Sri Lanka, which is about 22 million people. It's called Sangopati. Sangopati? Yeah, Sangopati area. Our partners are involved in national reconciliation in this ethnically and religiously divided nation. In the midst of civil war, our partners in the Church of Sri Lanka seek to provide community development, interfaith dialogue, and relief and rehabilitation to those affected by the violence. Global Ministries has three partners on the island, Church of the American Saloma Mission, Ecumenical Institute for Study and Dialogue, and the National Christian Council of Sri Lanka. I journeyed to a city called Batikaloa. While on this journey, I gained a friend. His name is Reverend Jude. He works at a local children's home. Reverend Jude took us to meet both men and women whose lives have been transformed from receiving microcredits. Some of the people I met were a peanut farmer, who employs his best friend, and now they have an opportunity to provide income from both of their families. I met another peanut farmer who's a woman, who gets support from her local neighbors who are also women as well. I met fishermen who work together to support not only their families, but they work to provide fish to sell for their local community. I met a female store owner who owns one of the only stores within her community. Through the success of her store, she's able to send all of her children to school and her husband is now able to build a well, which is one of the very few wells within their community. Microcredits are not the only form of advancement taking place in Sri Lanka. CACM supports a vocational program for youth and young adults at St. John's. This school provides training in areas such as computers, welding, shop work, and printing. CACM also supports a sewing initiative for housewives. The income these women receive helps provide independence for a lot of them. They are able to send their kids to school and have income all for themselves. Many of the students in the program come from broken or impoverished homes and through learning a vocational skill, they receive access to opportunity. Sometimes access can be a major launching path for change in their lives. CACM has a special project for victims of civil war in the Wani region. Wani and Jaffna were deeply affected by the war. Today, over 40,000 landmines are still left in the region. During my visit, I went to an after-school program for children whose families were impacted by the Civil War. While there, I met a man who lost his leg from a landmine that was left in the region after the war ended. His name was Vishvanathan. 
முடிவெடுத்திருந்தோம் அந்த வகையில் நாங்கள் இந்த இங்கே இந்த பாடசாலை ஆரம்பித்தபடியாக இங்கே ஒரு கிராமத்தில் உள்ள பிள்ளைகள் கொஞ்சம் கல்வியில் முன்னேற்றம் அடைந்து வருகிறார்கள் அதே போல் இன்னும் மென்மேலும் அவர்கள் நல்லபடியாக முன்னேற்றத்துக்கு வர வேண்டும் அடுத்தபடியாக இந்த கிராமத்தை பொறுத்தவரையில் இங்கு கரையோர பகுதி அந்த கரையோர பகுதியில் வந்து எங்களுக்கு வறட்சி பிரச்சனை அதாவது தண்ணி பிரச்சனை ஒன்று இருக்குங்கிறது மற்றது இங்கு கூடுதலான தொழில் முயற்சிக்கு சரியான கஷ்டமாக இருக்கும் In addition to being deeply impacted by the war, people in the region are experiencing water scarcity and extreme levels of drought. Churches are doing their best to provide assistance and resources for communities in such dire situations. The goal of the Church of the American Salon Mission is to empower children and youth by helping them receive an education and basic human rights. The ministry accomplishes this goal by providing daycare, evening classes, leadership training, sports activities, nutritional meals, and school supplies. Today we are, we are here with the youth uh, of Bandi region of uh, CSCM. Uh, we have started this camp day for yesterday on Friday. The theme of uh, this camp is towards God justice. We are discussing about God justice and injustice and also the love, uh, compassion, honest truth and gender in the justice. So we start this camp every day in the morning uh, around 7:30 and we have Bible study. Then evening also we have Bible study. we reflect on biblically uh, god's justice in between we have a secular uh, studies regarding the justice then afternoon this youth uh, they do a presentation connecting the secular justice and the biblical justice uh, as a drama or songs as anything when we visited a preschool program i was able to see how the support of global ministries goes beyond providing resources for educational needs but the support helps provide children with nutritional needs as well in some cases the meals these children eat while at school are their only meals they'll have throughout the day as i thought about my experience in sri lanka i remembered what bishvanathan said he saw the work that the church was doing and then he was able to hear the gospel keep us in your prayer every sunday or whenever you come together remember us and keep us in your prayer ask god to give us stand to stand for justice for justice for this tamil community because i always think the money and other things are second secondary we want stand to stand you know that that uh, the power uh actually i ask all my friends in usa especially in ucc whenever you come together remember uh, church of the american salon mission and tamil people in your prayer and ask god lord give them strength to because whenever you be feel oh how much we lost is there any future for us is there any life for us you always you know sometimes we ask is, is is god there like that so we ask our friends to keep us in their prayer not to lose our faith and but to stand for the uh, justice second we expect our support to develop this young people uh, the one generation they spend nearly you know nearly more than 4 30 years of war uh, our we spend our much time in the uh, during in the displacement uh, running here and they are spending time in the pg camp you know even when they went to school they spend their time in the bunker so we expect uh, especially ucc and global ministry to support by youth programs and children ministry 
so that would be great helpful for us to develop this uh, young generation. Uh, if you use this young generation, there's no future for them. Our partners in Sri Lanka are working to be open, caring, and giving. Bangladesh is a predominantly Muslim country. It is also known for its lush greenery and many waterways. The people of Bangladesh make their living from a variety of ways, agriculture, textiles, garments, seafood processing, fertilizer production, and so much more. Not meatful. Many of the people are landless and are forced to live on and cultivate flood-prone land. Periodic severe flooding during monsoons has grown due to global warming. Climate change and severe issues impact the lives and livelihoods of Bangladeshi people. We have two partners in Bangladesh, the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh and the Church of Bangladesh, who are working to help the lives of Bangladeshi people. As we traveled with our partner, the Christian Commission for Development, we were able to visit two very important programs that deal with climate change and poverty reduction. One of the first programs we visited was a poverty reduction program with women who have received microcredit loans and have created a community group known as Forums. These forum groups play a significant role in increasing household income as well as poverty reduction. Microcredits are provided to men and women who want to receive low interest loans to begin a business. In one forum group, women from a Muslim area have effectively come together to change their community. It was outstanding to see that women were actively impacting the lives of so many around them. Women are able to send their children to school, sell milk and other products at fair bulk value that allows for a greater return on their investments. Working together has proven to be a big benefit for these women. The women pay a monthly fee, which allows them to do community activism and development. Women make up 49% of the population in Bangladesh, but don't have access to electricity and clean cooking. CCDB has introduced a low, low cost, agro-friendly cook stove. We met some amazing women who felt empowered by using this cook stove. One in particular is Monkihushi Halder. She's been using the Aka stove for years. It's the agro-friendly cook stove. She received a micro loan many years ago and through that loan made many assets that have grown beyond her imagination. She now has a pond, a grocery store, and raises livestock. In 2000, she became a member of a forum group. She first took out a loan to rent a grocery store and now owns that grocery store in front of her house. She received another loan to purchase a cow. With maintaining the shop and her livestock, she was able to take out another loan to buy land and build a house and cultivate on that land. Her house was actually built out of agro-friendly material. She really believes in taking care of the environment. One of her businesses is actually composting. Monkashi has over 60 clay pots, which she puts about 200 kilograms of compost and sells it to other organic farmers. Okay. Hello, matcha. Yes. This is matcha. Yeah, matcha tea. Who is my husband today? Gam to matcha is a lovely dish. 
She hopes to continue to grow her business and support her family and community. On our next visit in Bangladesh, we went to Climate Technology Park. CCDB is embarking on something that has never been done in the world. Climate resiliency and climate education are big factors for this park. CCDB is geared towards building climate resilient communities through reducing risk, creating sustainable income, generating options and introducing climate adaptive agriculture, Along with Climate Technology Park, CCDB has an initiative also known as the Bangladesh Lighthouse Project. They're using these two initiatives to really help transform climate resilience education. They are keen on using adaptive technology to help low-income communities. Bangladeshi people deal with water erosion, drought, monsoons, and other major climate change issues. Climate Technology Park is an initiative by CCDB to exhibit innovative, sustainable, low-cost technology effective for climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. The park is intended to be a hub for innovative climate change techniques that help people. Climate Technology Park showed us new techniques and resources that are actually helping people right now. Local farmers and fishers now have new resources to help them adapt to ever-changing forces in nature. Indonesia is the fourth most populous nation in the world with both the world's largest Muslim population and largest number of Protestant Christians in Asia. The Evangelical Church of West Timor, also known as Gamit, is building bridges among Christians in the region. By creating programs that combat human trafficking, climate change, drought, agriculture, health education regarding HIV and AIDS, and school reform, Migration and human trafficking are among the larger issues that Indonesia is facing. In West Timor, villages are losing people due to migration and trafficking every day. Grandparents are being forced to raise their grandchildren. Throughout our visit in Indonesia, we were able to see how the church is becoming an integral component in communities. This has allowed marginalized people to receive opportunity. When I exited the plane, I saw enormous amounts of caskets arriving and leaving the airport. I soon realized that the caskets were bodies of people who were trafficked or who had migrated. Global Ministries partner, the Evangelical Church of West Timor, also known as Gamit, is working to combat migration and human trafficking by supporting local business owners who have created programs that empower and employ low-income women as seamstresses and store workers at a local clothing store. We visited Reverend Evie's art and clothing store. While there, I was able to meet so many of her employees whose lives have been changed by working at her store. Another way that Gamit is trying to slow down migration is by helping local farmers develop and sell their produce. The program has impacted so many people. For example, I met a young man who goes by the name Captain. He migrated and began working as a fisherman on a boat that traveled around the islands of Indonesia. Captain unfortunately got sick and had to return home when doctors were unable to help him. Captain believes his faith in God has healed him, so he decided to stay home and cultivate his family's land. Captain's best friend decided to return back to West Timor to help him cultivate his land. So many people on the island of West Timor are not thriving as farmers. So, Captain decided to get connected 
with someone from his church and began working with the Compostani program, which stands for pastors who like to farm. This commit program has shown Captain how to grow and sell his produce. Also met another farmer named James, who was a local teacher who doesn't get paid regularly yet for teaching, so he has to work on his family farm with his parents to support his family. With the help of Gamit, James and his father have been able to implement organic farming techniques that produce a healthier quality of produce and yield just enough money to support their family. One of the most effective ways in which Gamit is trying to change the law of migration is through educating children. I never received such an introduction like this. I was in awe at how these children welcomed me. I was so eager to just sit down and speak with them all. Most of the children on this island of Kapong were received in education up until the ninth grade. Their educational system is fairly poor Gamit hopes that by supporting Christian schools, they will be able to inspire children to achieve more than the last generation. Education is a great component in helping to inspire and change the minds of generations. I met so many women who were farmers. A lot of these women have husbands who have migrated to help support their families. But unfortunately, a lot of their husbands don't return or don't send enough money back to help support their families. So these women have gotten together to become farmers and support one another. They use each other's land to help cultivate and grow produce that they then can sell at a greater market value while working together. Gamit is working to provide education to local villages who are at a higher risk of experiencing large amounts of migration. It is the hope of Gamit that through agriculture and economic programming, more people will remain on this island and will be able to have sufficient income so that the need to migrate will no longer exist. Gamit is also working to provide education for these at-risk people about the signs of trafficking. Some places in Indonesia suffer from severe drought and are deeply impacted by climate change. While traveling on this island of Timor, we saw water planning projects that deal with drought and agriculture. You might be wondering, what is water planting? Water planting is when farmers plant plants that retain water and dig trenches alongside hillsides that then carry the water down those trenches into wells. I met an elder in a local community who has planted over 20 wells with his wife. I've met so many amazing people. Their smiles and their faces will forever be imparted in my mind. It is my hope and prayer that we all will continue to walk together in hope.
Each of these places that we visited has their own stories of struggles and hopes to share with the wider world. Despite limitations and differences, churches within these regions work to respond together whenever possible to human need and suffering and to uphold the cause of justice, peace, and human dignity in partnership with others, including people of other living faith and people movements. Thanks for being willing to go on this pilgrimage with me. I expect that some of the things you have seen and heard will stick with you for a long time. Please take some time to process, reflect, and consider next steps. We at Global Ministries look forward to walking with you as you determine the ways in which you would like to connect with the ministries of partners in Southern Asia and around the world. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Well, thank you for sharing that video with us, Brandy. I just want to make a note for all of our viewers that Brandy's video will be available on Global Ministries YouTube and Facebook pages starting on June 23rd at 1 p.m. Uh, so you all can watch it again and share it with others. Um, this webinar is also currently being recorded and will be up on the UCC and Global Ministries YouTube pages as well for future viewing. And just a quick note that to reminder that uh, Brandy did film all of this in 2019 before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So now I want to introduce my colleague Dina Bandu Manchala, who is the area executive for Southern Asia, and he's going to talk a little bit about the pandemic and how it's impacted the work and lives of our partners in the region. Welcome, Dina Bandu. Thank you, Becca. Good afternoon, friends, and thank you, Brandy, for that beautiful video. Just a few months after Brandy's return, the region was invaded by the coronavirus. And like elsewhere in the world, life has never been the same in these parts of the world too. Since then, the lives of the people of those communities that we have seen in Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, and Indonesia have become much more complicated and more vulnerable. But of course, our partners in these regions, in these places, continue to persist in whatever they are able to do, not only to continue with what they have started, but also to meet the needs of these communities. Now, as Becca said, you know, Brandy visited these places in 2019. And now I would like to sort of give you an account of a brief update about these places what they are now and how our partners are coping with these demands of the time. Now, Sri Lanka to begin with has been through many lockdowns and multiple dislocations of sorts. Though the number of cases and deaths have been low, the country remains exposed to the third wave and a host of other issues. The ethnic minority Tamils, Muslims and the fishing and tea plantation workers continue to be discriminated, both in terms of relief material, as well as access to vaccines. There seems to be a vaccine apartheid within the country. Only the predominantly Sinhalese Buddhist paths are going through a rapid vaccination drive, but a vaccination process has been slow and sporadic in the north and eastern parts of the country. Now, only about 2.8% of the population have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated of date. Global Ministries partner, Church of American Ceylon Mission, continues to reach out to these communities, offering dry rations as well as medical supplies. Some of this work is also done in collaboration with Muslim and Hindu groups. The interesting thing is that interfaith collaboration in meeting human need is certainly liberative to religions and religious communities as they affirm their common vocation of affirming and protecting life. And this is the message that we get from Sri Lanka. India. India has just been through a deadly third wave that saw hundreds and thousands of people dying every day for a full month. We have seen all of it on the television. 
The city of Delhi, where Brandy visited, is slowly limping back to normalcy. India, with its 1.4 billion population, will remain vulnerable, though, to further attacks until at least a billion people are uh, vaccinated. But that would be almost a year to reach that stage. Right now, but only about 3.6% of the people of the population of India are fully vaccinated. Meanwhile, our partners, Indian Samaritans and the Center for Social Equity and Inclusion, both based in Delhi, continue to be engaged with the communities in Kirby Place that we have seen and Kusumpur Pahad. Most of these families are daily wage workers without any legal residential status. Therefore, they do not have access to whatever government provides. However, our partners, Center for Social Equity and Inclusion and Indian Samaritan continue to assist and accompany these two communities. Now let's go to Bangladesh. The situation in Bangladesh uh, that we got to see in this documentary is much the same as in India and Sri Lanka. There again, only 2.6% of the population are vaccinated. It is not just COVID alone, but the continuing impact of climate change further complicates the lives and adds more challenges to these communities. Remoteness, lack of work and access to relief and medical supplies are the common and also the serious problems for these communities. Our partner, Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, continues to reach out to these communities in the remote coastal districts of Bangladesh with relief and medical supplies. And now, lastly, let's go to Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world. It consists of five major islands and about 30 smaller groups of islands. And there are a total number of 17,500 islands in Indonesia. So you can imagine the extent of uh, area that needs to be covered as part of any relief efforts. The spread of the virus has been slow initially last year, but has been gradual during this year. One year on, it seems to be spreading rapidly now. However, only 4.2% are vaccinated. As per predictions, it would probably be the end of 2022 or early 2023 when Indonesia would be fully vaccinated. Uh, say at least 70% in order to claim herd immunity status. Till then, these communities will remain exposed uh, to the virus along with the cyclones, earthquakes, and a whole lot of political and social unrest. Our partner, GMIT, or Protestant Evangelical Church in Timor, is responding to the needs of the communities as best as it can, particularly in reaching out to the families of migrant workers who have returned from other places for lack of work, and also those in far-flung rural areas and remote islands. In conclusion, let me uh, make a three um, observations. Uh, based on the sharing that we have had. You know, one is that all these four countries are multi-religious contexts. India, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, where Christians are a minority. All our partners are working with the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor. Even though the churches are small and many and themselves vulnerable, the point is that they do not hesitate to get involved in being diaconal communities. And I think that is a message that we receive from the sharing. The second thing is that these four contexts also testify to the vaccine inequality, inequity. 
even though all of us around the world, over 200 countries, even though no country has escaped unhurt, but in matters of healthcare, treatment, drugs, and vaccines, some have proved that they are more privileged and have better access to these than the rest. It seems as though our common experience of vulnerability has failed to tame our tendency to assert our distinct access and locations of privilege. In other words, even if the virus did not discriminate, we seem to have developed mechanisms to ensure that the vaccine respects the discriminatory spaces and protocols of our world. And lastly, at the mo at, at a moment in time, amidst the pandemic that has exposed the inequities, inequalities and injustices, assisting and accompanying these communities and our partners in these countries and elsewhere seems a moral and spiritual imperative than a humanitarian response. Thank you. Thanks, Dina Bandu. Um, I just had a, a couple questions for you. As we bring the Southern Asia Initiative to a close here, um, your regional initiative is the, I think, third or fourth of the ones that we've done so far with Global Ministries. What are some uh, learnings that we can take from our partners in the region? Uh, what are some things that, that you've learned uh, and mostly because this is the first time we've had an initiative in the middle of a pandemic, what are some of these uh, learnings that we can take away? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, as I said uh, just a while ago, is that, you know, all our partners, organizations are in, in, a, in context where uh, the Christians are small in number. They're not only small, but there are many and divided also to, to, to a great extent. And in spite of all of that, in, in spite of them being small in number, they are fully engaged in reaching out to the poorest of the poor. And I think the point here is that uh, the, the, the numerical size doesn't really matter at all for a church to be a church in situations where it is demanded of them to give an account of their faith, account of hope. So that is one thing that really stands out in this context. The second thing is that in most places, in all these places, in fact, uh, churches don't actually always work alone or respond to these challenges all by themselves. They are often done in partnership with other people of other faiths, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and in other communities. And I think that is where we need to learn, as I said, that uh, protecting life, affirming life, safeguarding life, and, you know, is something that, the, that every religious community, every faith advocates. And, you know, at moments like this, it is necessary for the churches to come together and do the same thing. And in many of these places, the churches are doing that in spite of the fact that there are forces that are working against this, especially uh, the, the fundamentalist forces or the religious supremacist forces which are asserting themselves, um, you know, all the more uh, powerfully these days in many of these countries that we uh, we work in Southern Asia region. And uh, yeah, and the third thing is that, you know, it's not just sort of uh, uh, doing some diagonal work here and there, meeting human need, and, you know, especially those who are suffering, but these churches are also quite engaged in, um, in advocacy issues, you know, especially in, um, in responding to the challenges of uh, human trafficking or the forced migration or discrimination of Dalits or violence against women and uh, violence against or discrimination of uh, religious minorities. So these are very important advocacy issues that the churches and our partners are fully engaged in especially uh, in, you know, in, in giving visibility and expression uh, to these silenced and, uh, and, uh, and, and violated communities. So these are some of the things that I can say as the learnings from the Southern Asia region. 
Great, and I'll just point out to our viewers that if we've started the Southern Asia Initiative in the summer of 2019, so we've had a lot of resources and materials and projects and partners throughout these almost two years. Um, so I encourage you all to visit our website. We have worship materials, we have advocacy resources, we have great videos that Brandy helped pull together, uh, all kinds of resources that, that you can use in your local churches. And I will just add that I had the opportunity opportunity to go on a pilgrimage like Brandy did. I went on this pilgrimage, it was the end of January 2020, so right before the pandemic really got going globally. And I will echo what Dina Bandhu has just said, that it, I was amazed at the, the hospitality, the welcoming, and the call to this gospel of Christ that uh, everyone showed while we were there. They really were, you know, not themselves the, in the, the, the high elite categories, but they were helping their neighbors no matter how little they had. They were living out the gospel, and I felt really impressed and touched by that. Um, and it was just, you know, I feel like I've, I've experienced this in a number of countries. It's the, the poorest among us who are the uh, wealthiest in trying to, to serve their communities and to help others. I've received such warm welcomes from places that have very little to share and little to give. So um, I just want to echo uh, what Dina Bandu said. Um, and if you want to help support some of our partners and projects highlighted throughout the initiative, uh, you can do that through Global Ministries as well. Um, we'll have a, an email that goes out and the, these resources will all be put in the um, description box on the YouTube page for, for this um, live stream later. Um, we've got just a few minutes left. I don't see any other questions from our audience coming through. Dina Bandu, Brandy, do you have any last reflections or words that you want to add? No. Okay, hearing none. Brandy, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was saying no since no one else does. Okay. <laughs> All right, well then, uh, I, I, we're going to finish up a little early today, which is great. Um, again, if you want to support the work of our partners in Southern Asia, uh, please consider giving through Global Ministries. Um, and then uh, our next webinar in the Wednesdays with the World series will be on Wednesday, June 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, it's going to be all about the Thursdays in Black campaign against uh, rape and gender-based violence. So come join us then to hear a little bit about the campaign, about how the United Church of Christ is involved in it, and ways that you can support it. Um, so with that being said, Dina Bandu, will you please close us in prayer? I will. Let's pray. God of grace and life, we come to you at this hour, calling the people in Southern Asia and elsewhere in our prayers as they suffer the ravages of the pandemic and are exposed to the realities of the loss of life, pain and anguish and grief and uncertainties at this moment. We pray for the families who have lost their loved ones, those battling for life, and those who are exposed to the devastating impact of these losses on their families and communities. Grant healing to those who are suffering and protection and strength and courage to those who are serving. God, we do not ask you to take us back soon to our familiar world, but to accompany us and help us accompany one another as we walk through this unknown and frightful path. Help us to discern the mystery of this phenomenon and to look for your new signposts that we may walk on the paths that take us to new realities that ensure life with justice and dignity for all. This we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Siblings in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 
444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed as you continue your day. Know that you are not alone, and we are holding you in prayer. Amen.